Thank you. Recording in progress. Oh dear. What are we what are we going to do about that, right? <laughs> so, anyway, uh, this is a recording if I look at my calendar for June the 7th, okay? Hopefully you had a nice holiday um last Monday, okay? Memorial Day, mm, ate a lot of hot dogs and uh, apple pie and all that stuff, right? Unless you're doing barbecue ribs. So uh, we're gonna wrap it up. This is gonna be the last uh, video of the spring quarter, 2021, uh, World Civilizations One. There might be a World Civilizations Two in your future. Who knows? Look, it's looking like it. So, um, and then the following week, we'll have our final. So you can relax there, right? Because I'll get you so prepared that you can just do the final in a few minutes and you're done. Okay. All right. So let me proceed and see if I know what I'm doing here. It's been a while. Okay. Share the screen. What are the, okay. Here's the material. Oh, let me get myself out of the way first. Come on, there we go, down on the bottom, okay. Start sideshow from the beginning, world civilizations, okay, and here we go. Europe, new ideas and new nations. The ancient regime of pre-1789 Europe could not be brought back regime is like the kingdom, the old style kingdom or government of whatever went on before 1789 Europe. After all the changes, it could not be brought back. So in countries other than France, many of the political, legal, and social reforms that the French Revolution had brought or attempted to bring were delayed or even temporarily reversed. In France, However, the changes since 1789 were too popular to be ignored. Yes, too popular in France. And the forces unleashed or let go by the Industrial Revolution in England were going to remake the society of Western Europe by the mid 19th century. The throne shaking revolts, throne is the king's throne, Revolts of 1848 were the direct result of the changes set in motion by industrialization and by the ideas of 1789. So industrialization, you kind of think of, that's when machines started coming in and people started working in factories and Europe started moving away from being mostly a farming continent. After the defeats of 1848, European liberals and nationalists were in retreat during the next decade and conservative statement, statesmen were everywhere in control. But only 20 to 30 years later, many of the goals of the liberals had been reached and nationalism was already one of the givens of policy making. The universal male franchise was introduced in several countries. Governments in many places legalized labor unions and Russia freed its serfs. So we will find out about the serfs uh, later. It's kind of a low level uh, strapped in working class. The Western world was entering the second industrial revolution, again, industry, and the massive social changes that accompanied it. Okay, so uh, I usually read these sidebars here, but these are very, very confusing and some things we're not gonna touch on. So I really don't wanna confuse you on that. So at the end of this page, I do have one question for you. Okay, as you know, I gotta have questions, gotta go to the whiteboard. 
There we go. Do I already have my pencil? No. Okay, here we go. It's gonna be a long question. And you know what that means? You get a short answer. Okay, where do we go here? What happened? All right. I do most of the work here. Let me make sure I'm getting this word correctly. Okay. So again, I'm trying to use keywords from the reading so that you can easily, easily catch the answer instead of me, a lot of teachers re change the words and make it hard for you to find the answer. I'm the opposite, I want you to do very well. Okay, let me see if I can stretch this a little bit. Maybe to a two Z, okay, instead of a four Z. Uh, much of the history of Europe in the past two centuries, so that's 200 years, is a reflection of what? And if you look for a reflection, the word reflection, you'll find the answer. So let me give you a minute on that. Okay, so that should be enough time there. So repeating, much of the history of Europe in the past two centuries is a reflection of what? Eraser. Okay. All right. What happened to my, uh, huh? Okay, I lost my PowerPoint there. There we go. So we ended down here at accompanied it. Okay, let me make sure this is pushed down. Okay. So liberalism in politics and economics. Much of the history of the past two centuries, here it's repeating the answer, especially in Europe has been a reflection of sustained revolutionary changes in politics and economics. Too many answers. The political revolution was highlighted by events in the United States between 1775 and 1789, 14 years. And in France, between 1789 and 1800, uh, 11 years, which we looked at in earlier chapters. The economic revolution was slower and less spectacular, but it was at least as important over the long run. It was generated by the changes in industrial production that took place beginning in the second half of the 18th century, particularly in Britain, by the conquest of space through the railroads. That means space and area, not space and space on, uh, above the earth, but the space of land. And by the immense growth of population in Europe and the United States. <clears throat> As is often the case, Changes in one sphere or one area reinforce changes in the other in all kinds of ways. Two examples will suffice or be sufficient. That's where suffice comes from. In the 1790s, during the period of directory in France, a tiny group of conspirators tried to eliminate property-based distinctions and their efforts at sharing equally the products of human labor got nowhere. A generation later, 
another group of theorists, people who have theories, was determined to replace the abuses and exploitation of early capitalism with the humane ideas of equality and mutual care. This was the origin of an organized multinational effort to introduce governmental responsibility for the welfare of the citizenry. And that's kind of like what Biden is trying to do right now, trying to tell everybody, just let the government take care of you. And a lot of people think that's great, you know, but with a social, socialism like that, it makes it difficult for other people who want to work hard and maybe become rich, right? Uh, two, the middle classes guided the eighth century political revolution, <coughs> excuse me, on their own behalf. Later, the more perceptive among them recognized that without the active assistance of much of the laboring classes, they could not gain and hold power against the aristocracy, which again, we've talked about many times. That's the high level kings and queens, right? The aristocracy, princes. The industrial laboring classes were growing rapidly, but lacking leadership from within their own ranks. Instead, during the later 19th century, a partnership grew up in Western Europe between the middle class reformers and newly enfranchised working class voters, which brought about substantial improvement in the condition of ordinary people. That's a good thing. Where is that arrow? It's hiding from me. Okay. Um, the liberal sons and daughters of the Enlightenment everywhere formed a party of reform dedicated to changing the traditional class-based system of political representation. By 1815, much had been achieved in those respects in America and France, but the conservative reaction nullified or canceled some of those gains everywhere in Europe. Only in France and England was much of the liberal political agenda retained. Parliaments in both countries, similar to Congress in the United States were responsible to the voters rather than to the king. And freedom of conscience was guaranteed. So now we head into the gospel of free enterprise. Another side of the liberal philosophy focused on freedoms in the marketplace and the rebellion against traditional restrictions imposed by mercantilism. Economic liberalism grew directly from the path-breaking work of Adam Smith, whose ideas were mentioned briefly in chapter 32. What did Smith's adherents want? So adherents means the people who followed him and his ideas. They wanted laissez-faire. Uh, if a government would only let them alone to do what they saw best, laissez-faire, the merchants and manufacturers of every nation would produce goods and services to meet the demands of the market most efficiently and economically. So this is against what I just said on the previous page about a lot of people want that socialistic, well, let the government just take care of us, you know? Except there's some drawbacks to that, you know, like socialistic countries, they have like 60% tax on your income. So just think, I'll, I'll make it easy. You make a dollar, uh, the government can 60 cents of it, you get 40, right? So you make $100, they get $60 of it, you get 40. But some people like that, I guess, I don't know, I don't like it. Uh, because, oh, I get free medical and I get free this and I get free that, right? So here, this says this laissez-faire that, hey, let us work as hard as we want. And then the market itself, since it's open and free, not controlled by the government, will set a price what people are willing to pay. Okay. Okay. This is about a painter. We don't need to uh, learn about this. Wanderer in the sea of clouds. Uh, but I do have a question now. Okay. You know, I got to get those questions in there. This one's not going to be quite as long, thank God. Okay. okay. We just read about this at the bottom. Okay. 
Okay, what does laissez-faire mean? You, you, I just gave you the definition, so just give it back to me. Let me stretch this to be a onesie. There we go. Let me give you a minute on that. Okay, you got that? Okay. All right, so again, repeating, what does laissez-faire mean? Was it a good thing, a bad thing? Who knows? Only the people who watch the video. Okay, it's done. All right, back to the material. This is where we left off, the gospel of free enterprise. Okay, on to the next definitions. Free trade. This also gets into laissez faire if you want to do it extensively. The existing mercantile system of quotas, licenses, and subsidies, subsidies should be eliminated, and producers should be allowed to trade with any place and anyone at prices that the free market would set. The less government, the better. See, again, these people want way less government. Okay, because again, in a socialist government, they tell you that a banana costs $10 and there's no free market enterprise about it. As the first two conditions success, the economic liberals despised governmental, despises a form of hate, controls of any sort in the economy, even though Smith made certain important exceptions to laissez-faire. They believe that the free market alone would provide guidance for policy decisions. Again, they believe heavily in the free market. In early 19th century England, extreme laissez-faireism, often called Manchester liberalism, because of its popularity with the cotton mill owners in Manchester, provided the employers of industrial labor with an excuse for the systematic exploitation of the weak. Using theorists such as Thomas Malthus, an essay, he wrote an essay on population, published in 1798, and David Ricardo, who wrote The Iron Law of Wages, published in 1817. The Manchester liberals believed that the poor would always be poor because of their excessive birth rate and other supposed moral faults, and that it was the well-off of people's duty to protect their material advantages by any means they could, because sympathizers with this line of thought the Whigs came into control of the British House of Commons after the electrical, oh, sorry, electrical, electoral reform that has to do with government. We have an electrical, electrical college here. Reform Act of 1832. The British government grew unsympathetic towards the idea of social protection of the lower classes. Only in the 1870s and later did a sufficient number of reformers emerge or come forth who rejected this heartless attitude and busied themselves with the improvement of the lot, that's a British word, that means situation, of the poor majority. Now we head on to conservatism. Uh, the liberals, though gaining strength, were by no means the sole or only players in the European political field after 1815. Supported by the wave of anti-Napoleonic nationalism, Conservative forces in Britain and France were powerful for at least a generation and elsewhere even longer. Conservatism in the first half of the 19th century meant one of two things. One was a moderate conservatism. The other was reaction. So 
So here we go into moderate conservatism. Conservatives of all stripes, which means all kinds, believe that an official religion was necess a necessity for instilling or teaching people proper respect for law and tradition. And a lot of people think that today, because uh, liberals today will say the same thing. They say, well, I don't need a religion to do what's right, right? I, I know what's right, so I'll never do anything wrong. But conservatives feel if you have a religious background of some kind, that doubly teaches you not to do something because a religious person, for example, will say, uh, it's against the law and it's against my religion to steal, let's say, where a person with no religion just says, well, I know it's not correct to steal, okay? So they feel it's a reinforcement. Um, <clears throat> these moderate conservatives could not imagine a state in which church and government were separated by law. They supported a constitution, but rejected political democracy as being the rule of the mob. So you have 100 people in front of your house and what they say goes. Why? Because it's a mob. They believe that only those who had a stake in society, evidenced by property, could take on the burdens of self-government. Moderate conservatism was supported by a large percentage of ordinary Europeans, probably a majority, who had been appalled or sickened or disgusted by Jacob Jacobin radicalism and Napoleon's arrogance. The clergy, both Catholic and Protestant, were the leaders of moderate conservatism in much of the continent. The more enlightened aristocrats who could see what would happen if turning the clock back were to be adopted as state policy also contributed to moderate conservatism. I'm gonna to have to move myself here so we can read, okay? They wish to avoid revolutions in the future by making some necessary concessions and concessions mean that you will do certain things, right? They ask you, if you do this, then we won't have a revolution or we won't do that, okay? All right, so I'm at the bottom here. And uh, so I got a question for you. You got that pencil? This should be easy peasy. Okay. What did conservatives believe? Let me stretch this out. Okay, there's a onesie. So have a go at that. Let me give you a minute or two. Okay, let me grab the eraser. Okay, what did conservatives believe? Did they believe in the Los Angeles Rams? What did they believe in? Okay, all right. Okay, let's go back to the material. So we're down here at necessary concessions now and moderate conservatism. Flip the page. All right, so now in economics, they favor the continuation of government controls and trade, especially foreign trade. So they're, that's where, you know, let's say we got some stuff from another country, we able, want to be able to tax them, right? And industry. They thought that Smith was well-meaning but wrong and that without such supervision by authorities, selfish and greedy entrepreneurs would only harm the national welfare, which means the national state of being. I don't know about that. So where we talked about moderates, now we got to get into the reaction. Reactive conservatism was the rule in Prussia, Austria, and Russia, where few, if any, political concessions were made 
to the new social structures, structures uh, being created by the changing modes or ways of production. This led to explosive pressures, which eventually burst or exploded forth in the revolts of 1848 and the upheaval of World War I and its revolutionary aftermath. In Prussia and Austria, the reactionary conservatives ruled for a generation after 1850. They denied a constitution, retained the established church, whether Catholic or Protestant, and maintained strict class distinctions in justice, taxation, and voting rights. Both countries also maintained a form of serfdom until 1848. Uh, in Russia, which meant not only the Russian ethnic groups, but also much of what is now independent Eastern Europe, the reactionaries were now independent. Uh, I'm sorry, the reactionaries were also in command. Tsar Alexander, that's the word for king or actually Caesar, right? Uh, Alexander's successor, Nicholas I, ruling from 1825 to 1855, was a sincere believer in God's designation of autocracy for Russia and a died in the wool, which means 100% reactionary. During his reign or king, uh, king time, Russia was called the gendarme of Europe, eager to send troops. Gendarme is a French word for police. Uh, eager and ready to send troops to put down liberal agitation or you know, liberal protests or revolutionary change wherever it might rear or show its ugly head. All of Europe was split. We just divided on one side or the other during the entire post or after Napoleonic generation between these reactionary forces and their liberal opponents. Now we head on internationalism. Besides the struggle between liberal and conservative, another source of conflict appeared in post-1815 Europe, popular nationalist feeling. Modern political nationalism has its origins in France between 1792 and 1795, when the Jacobins insisted on the duties imposed on all citizens by patriotism. Later, when the French occupied half of Europe, their subjects' patriotic reaction against the occupier contributed mightily to the growth of nationalism elsewhere. Okay, looks like I'm gonna have to move this sucker again. Try to put it in the center here. Early nationalism was a culturally benign phenomenon, which means it really wasn't strong. It was positive in its goals and tolerant in its outlook. So it didn't have a clear goal. Thus one could simultaneously strive for the freedom of the individual and the free nation. Sometime in the 1840s and later, however, nationalism in much of Europe lost its constructive, tolerant character. Uh -oh. This later phase was marked by the rise of negative qualities with which we modern times are thoroughly familiar we versus they, and right versus wrong. Nationalism as a zero sum game where one nation's gain is another nation's loss, vice versa. This nationalism was characterized by a conviction or strong belief of cultural superiority over other nations. Okay, so you know I have a question here. Where did modern political nationalism begin? Question four, and I shall stretch. 
All right, so let me give you a minute for that. Alrighty then. Better bring this back down. Getting the eraser, repeating, where did modern political nationalism begin? Again, my funny guys, I don't want to hear. Oh, it began in K-Town in 2021. No. Okay. All right. Back to the material. We had ended here at the bottom over other nations and nationalism. So let us continue. It degenerated or got worse in the Balkans or Balkans countries and Eastern Europe. That's where the Balkans are in Eastern Europe. For many distinct peoples lived in mixed communities and regions without clear territorial lines. Here nationalism soon became an excuse for one war after another in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Now we move on to Socialism in the pre-Marx era, I guess Karl Marx is the most famous name and the supposedly progenerator of uh, communism and socialism, but they were socialists before him, believe it or not. As we have seen, the earliest socialists were a handful of conspirators, people that got together and conspired against the government, made plans against the government, in France in the 1790s. All of these preceded or were before Marx. What did the early socialist thinkers wish to achieve? What did they want to gain? Three chief economic goals were involved. One, a planned economy. The unregulated free market was entirely wasteful. That's what they felt, right? So what a piece of garbage, the free market haphazard way of supplying the needs and wants of most people. Two, greater equality. There was too much for the rich, too little for the rest, and too few in ways in which that situation could be changed peacefully and fairly. Three, ownership of income producing property by the state rather than private parties, meaning you, me, you guys should not own a house, but the government and the state can own houses. Only the state was powerful enough to resist the wealthy and ensure that the means of producing wealth were not controlled by a few. But unfortunately, in communist countries, they might talk about the people, but, uh, you know, people like Fidel Castro and Kim Jong-un, they are super multi-millionaire people, even though Castro used to come out in army clothes and say, I'm a common regular guy. You know, he didn't live that way. The most influential of the early socialists worked in France. Henry de Saint-Simon, 1760 to 1825, and was perhaps the most important of all. He believed further that the state, that is the government, had the positive duty to look out for those who were unable to look out for themselves. The misfits, which means the people who didn't fit in society. Uh, the incompetent people who, I guess, could not hold it together, maybe uh, present day like homeless people. And the disabled, okay, people who were mentally or physically disabled, could not work. Because the industrialized production would be so much more lavish or rich than anything previously seen, the economy of scarcity would soon be abolished and it would be no hardship for the productive majority to care for these welfare cases. Charles Fourier was an obsessive theorist of technology and organization. His vision of special self-contained units of precisely 
1,620 persons living and working together was one of the oddities of early social thought. Fourier was particularly important as a forerunner or person who went before of feminist equality in work and politics, and as the upholder of the demands of the emotional, passionate side of human nature in industrialized society. Pierre Proudhon was the first modern anarchist. So anarchist, he didn't like the government. He believed that the power of the state must be destroyed. See, anarchists usually do violence. If men and women were ever to be truly free and capable of living as human lives, he was convinced that government was at best barely tolerable evil because it was always controlled by the wealthy and was almost always the oppressor or people who held down other people of the poor. So that government, he felt controlled and held down the poor. In 1840, he posed his famous question, what is property? To which he gave a resounding answer. Property is nothing but organized theft. Again, a socialist telling you, if you own a house that, I don't care if you bought it and saved all your money for 20 years, you're stealing. It has been stolen from the sole creator of value, the worker, by the owning class. And it should be taken back by force if necessary. Again, by force and violence seems to be a common thread with socialism if they feel that that is a way to get what they want, right? All right, so I got a question here. Board. Okay. Who were the earliest socialists? Just list that small group. It's a small group. You should be able to do it. Yeah, stretch it to one. Go ahead. All right, race for time. Repeating, who were the earliest socialists? Let me see, Temujin, Mr. Huang, and Lesak Bak, maybe. Okay. So back to the material. Write it down here. It should be taken back by force um, if necessary. Okay. All right. In England, utopian socialism's leading figure. Utopia means like heaven on earth. And they feel that if you can reach true socialism, it will be heaven on earth, was Robert Owen. Owen was a remarkable man whose hard work and ambition made him a wealthy mill owner at the age of 27. Again, he worked hard, sacrificed, suffered, and became wealthy at the age of 27. I don't see how that's a bad thing. Inspired by a rugged Christianity, he was convinced that the industrial production and a decent life for workers was compatible. Good. At his famous cooperative textile mill in New Lanark, Scotland, Alwyn put his theories into practice and created a profitable enterprise that also provided very well for every need of its workers and their families. In the 1840s, socialism was still very much an idea or a theory of outsiders condemned as being against the laws of God and man. It was not taken seriously by most middle-class liberals and most economic liberals uh, thundered against it as unnatural. For their part, conservatives thought socialism terribly misunderstood human nature and was foredoomed to fail. 
Moving on, political events to 1848. Okay. Uh, in the period, Just after the Vienna Settlement of 1815, European international affairs were relatively calm. The quadruple alliance of the victors formed at Vienna was easily strong enough to suppress or fight off any attempts to overthrow the peace as long as its members agreed. Revolts by liberals in Spain in 1820 and Italy 1822 were quickly squelched or stopped but a nationalist guerrilla war by the Greeks against the Turkish overlords, 1827 to 1830, was allowed to commence or start and eventually succeed because it was a special circumstance of Christian versus Muslim. The Greek rebellion had a special connection to 19th century English literature. See the arts and culture box on Lord Byron. During this decade, the Spanish American colonies uh, were also allowed to break uh, away from the backward Spain, which was too weak to suppress their revolts by itself. First Mexico, then most of South America rebelled against Madrid and became independent states by 1825. Brazil, Portugal's one colony in the new world also broke away during this time. Let me just check. Doki, where is this thing? Yay. Hey, we got a big map here, Prussia and Austria after the Peace of Vienna. So this Prussia is what's going to become Germany later. The center of the continent was the scene of an increasing rivalry for leadership of the German speaking peoples uh, that lived in Austria and Prussia. Both emerged victors in 1815 and both were bulwarks of the reaction against the French revolutionary ideas. All right. Liberal states, France and Britain. Okay. Uh, in an almost bloodless revolution in 1830, the French threw out their unpopular bourbon ruler. That doesn't mean he drank a lot of bourbon. That was the name of the crest. In his place came Louis Philippe, ruling 1830 to 1848. Louis gladly accepted from Parliament a moderately liberal constitution, that was nice of him, which stated that sovereignty lay in the people, not in the throne, like meaning not with the king. The July monarchy, eight, the 18 years of Louis Philippe's reign or kingdom were a major step forward for liberalism. Citizen rights were granted and usually observed by the government but those rights were much more um, extensive uh, for the well-off than for the majority. So they're trying to say richer people had a better time with this than the poor. Social tensions were steadily building. Victor Hugo's great novel, Les Miserables, or the, if you saw the movie, Les Mis, is the best mirror of this epic or time. Over the protests of the conservative party, the Tories. In 1832, the Liberals and the British Parliament, the Whigs, passed the most important reform of voting rights since the Glorious Revolution. This Reform Act of 1832 stripped away many of the traditional political advantages of the landholding aristocrats and strengthened the previously weak urban middle class. Overnight, the House of Commons seats were distributed to urban and industrial districts. Because the Whigs controlled these districts, the composition of the Commons changed drastically. By making Parliament into a more representative national body, British government diminished the danger of a revolution. 
The British middle classes were assured of a parliament in which their voice would be heard and through which they could attain peaceable orderly change. In the later 19th century, these concessions would be extended to the working classes. Revolution and radical socialism never gained much following among the common folk in Britain for that reason. So hopefully you understand that at the end. Okay. The reactionary states, Austria, Russia, and Prussia. In the reactionary countries, the story was different. In Austria, Russia, and the Germanies, the rulers spent a generation after Napoleon attempting to hold back all thought of political liberalism. They didn't want to hear it. Through censorship, police and military force, diplomacy, and eventually war, they threw a dam across the tide of reform, which held until 1848. The Austrian emperor, the Russian czar, and the Prussian king rejected the kind of concessions to the French and British governments had made to their citizens. As a result, revolt seemed to many thinking people the only hope of bringing these countries into modern political and economic life. So for all this long reading, I have two questions now. So let's go back. Get that pencil for Temujin attacks. Question six. First question, what was the July monarchy? Stretching time. Okay, next question. List the reactionary countries. Now, let me give you a few to answer those, or at least write them down. All right, that should be enough time. Racer. Repeating, what was the July monarchy? So don't say, oh, that the July monarchy, that was a sale at Macy's for 4th of July. No. Seven list of reactionary countries. I'll give you a hint. I think there's less than five. Okay. All right. Back to a new share. We left off here, uh, modern political and economic life. Now we head on into the revolts of 1848. The revolt that broke out in the streets of working class Paris in late 1848 swept through Europe during the next year. These revolts of the lower classes combined with the explosion of nationalist conflicts and assertions of popular sovereignty, as people saying, we want popular sovereignty, set all of Europe aflame or on fire. 
the major countries, only Britain and Russia were spared. The revolts did not have a single cause, which means not, a, not one big single reason, nor did they have the same outcome. Nevertheless, at least three underlying similarities can be established. The revolts were initially led by middle-class liberals. The workers soon created their own more violent revolutions, uh-oh, against both aristocrats and the middle classes. And national divisions contributed to the failure of the revolts throughout Central and Eastern Europe. Consequences, well, what happened because of this? In instance after instance during 1848 and 1849, the barely concealed split between the middle class and the lower class enabled or helped the conservative forces to defeat the goals of both in the short term. The liberals got only a conditioned increase in political representation. The workers got nothing. Wow, that's bad. One, France, what happened there? The Second Republic established by the revolt lasted but three years before Louis Napoleon, Napoleon III, nephew of the great Bonaparte, used the power of the presidency to which he had begun, uh, been elected in 1848 to declare himself emperor. Okay, here we go. Presidency is not enough. You wanna be emperor, like king. So began the second empire in France, which saw the realization of most of the liberals economic and political goals, but little for the workers again. Um, so now we're Prussia. Uh, after a year of wrangling about the exact form, that means arguing, and provisions of a liberal constitution for a united Germany, the bulk or the majority of the German states reverted to the conservative regimes that had been briefly pushed aside by the revolts. German liberals had suffered a permanent defeat. Yeah. Uh, liberals didn't have an easy time in Germany, not like France. Uh, three, Austria. The new Austrian emperor, Franz Joseph, ruling 1848 through 1916, wow, already in 1916, relied on his aristocratic advisors to gradually regain control of the revolutionary situation. Vienna government pushed the separatist independent movements among the Czechs, Hungarians, and Italians within the empire and then intimidated the German liberals in Austria proper. By the summer of 1849, Austria was embarked or started a decade of old fashioned royal absolutism. Which all the ways of the king, we want it back. Forget about this liberal stuff. Italy, it is important to remember that Italy was no more than a collection of small kingdoms and the Papal States, which means under the Pope. Austria controlled the industrial north and the kingdom of Sardinia Piemont and the papacy divided the middle or the Pope divided the middle of the country. And the reactionary kingdom of Naples controlled the south and Sicily. Liberal Italians had long waited or wanted to unite Italy under a constitutional monarchy. They favored the Sardinian kingdom as the basis of this monarchy because it was the only state that had a native Italian secular, which means non-religious ruler. Many middle-class and uh, middle-class Italians, especially those in the Northern cities were anti-clerical and anti-papal, which means they were not religious and they did not support the Pope. Uh, they viewed the Popes as political reactionaries and upholders of class privilege that the Pope catered to the rich. Okay, and I got a question here. Pencil time. Okay, what happened in Paris in 1848 and where did it go next? Okay, 
And no, I don't think I can make that a onesie. Okay, so let me give you a minute for that. Okay, get that eraser. And uh, where is that thing? Okay, repeating what happened in Paris in 1848 and where did it go next? What, it was a certain movement. Okay. Back to the material. So I'm down here, upholders of class privilege. In 1848, anti-Austrian and anti-Papal riots broke out in various parts of Italy. Sardinia declared war on Austria. This proved to be a mistake. The Austrians were decisive in victors. Pope Pius IX in power 1846 to 1875 was so frightened by the Roman mobs that he opposed any type of liberalism from then on. In 1849, it appeared that a united Italy was as far away as it had ever been. Thus, the revolts and attempted revolutions had accomplished very little by 1850. Both middle-class liberals and working-class radical had been defeated by military force or its threat. Yet within a generation's time, almost all that the middle classes had fought for and even some of the demands of the radicals had come into being in many European capitals. The necessity of introducing a more industrialized economy overrode, or was of more importance, the objections of the old guard. Many of the thousands who were in prison for treason, and treason is when you do something against your own country, or violating public order from 1849 to 1850 would live to see the day when their governments freely gave the rights for which they had long fought. Okay. So I have a little painting over here, barricades in Vienna. Uh, and when Ritter painted this canvas shortly after the events, it depicts in revolutionary Vienna. Bourgeois revolutionaries atop the hill make common cause for a brief interval with the laborers gathered below again. Protesting, but kind of like middle-class high-level people and then the workers on the bottom that don't get anything out of it. At least that's what's stated here in the material. Okay, Russia. The first severe failure of the international uh, alliances set up by the Vienna treaties was the Crimean War, Crimean War, 1853 to 1856. Between Russia on one side and England, France and Turkey on the other. Expansionary ambitions led Tsar Nicholas I of Russia to demand Turkish concessions in Southeastern Europe. Once assured of British and French help, the Turks unexpectedly resisted. Oh my. The conflict was mostly fought on the Crimean Peninsula in the Black Sea. Yeah, I can bring this back down now. Where did this go? Okay, another big map here. Greece. Ottoman Empire, which is by Turkey, run by Turkey, by Romania, Austria, Germany, France, Italy. Here's the Sardinia, which they talked about. So all these places were talked about. Okay. 
Militarily, the war was a general debacle for all concerned, which means everybody lost, basically. It was not a, there was no clear victor. The Russian commanders and logistics were even less competent than those of the allies. So both, neither side had good strategies. It just kind of fought foolishly. So in time, Russia had to sue for peace. The Peace of Paris of 1856 was a drastic diplomatic defeat for St. Petersburg. And for the next 20 years, Russia was essentially bottled up in the South, unable to gain naval access to the Mediterranean. Its pressing internal problems would have to be addressed if it were to play any sizable role in future affairs. Now onto the great reforms. The military embarrassment in the Crimea hardened the determination of the new ruler of Russia, Tsar Alexander II, ruling 1855 to 1881. To tackle Russia's primary social and economic problem, the question of the serfs. Uh, Russia's serfs still lived in almost total illiteracy, so they didn't know how to read and write. They were ignorant, unschooled, and advanced topics. And they also had a lot of superstition. That's why they were just used for work, kept down. Not only were they growing increasingly resentful of their noble landlords and masters, but they were an immense drag on the Russian economy. Most had little money to consume anything, nor could they contribute to the nation's capital for desperately needed financial and industrial investments. In 1859, a determined Alexander commanded a quick resolution of the surf problem. In the following two years, a special appointed court commission worked out the details. And in 1861, the Tsar issued an order that abolished or got rid of serfdom in Russia. These people were like slaves. Although around 55 million individual serfs and their dependents were directly affected. Okay. Folks, this will be our last page. I cut it a little early this time, give you guys a break because you have a test to study for, final exam. So I don't want to cramp you with too much stuff, right? Try to be a little kind here. What then were the results of the long sought emancipation? Hmm. It unfortunately had very little limited success. Many were disappointed with their allotted or given portions of land. So it's like they gave them garbage, tiny areas of garbage with maybe land that could not grow any crops, uh, which later were either small or of poor quality. And that's what that means, the poor quality. You want to farm it and it won't, nothing will grow there. Instead of outright possession of the land, they received only a tentative title subject to restrictions imposed by the government. That's not a fair deal. The serfs could not mortgage or sell the land without permission from the village council, which was difficult to obtain. So instead of creating a class of prosperous, politically and socially engaged farmers, as the authorities in St. Petersburg had hoped, the emancipation of the serfs actually made a good many of them worse than before. Besides emancipation, Alexander II presided over several other major reforms in Russian public life. Uh, these so-called great reforms included the changes in the army and judicial systems. Most significantly, the central government reorganized local and provincial authority, changing its previously purely appointative nature. It allowed the election of a county commission called the Zemstov Board. Originally, the Zemstov Boards had few real powers, but they acted as a catalyst of civic support and helped the local peasants become aware of what they could do to better their lives. Seen in the larger perspective, however, what Alexander did not do was more important than what he did. Like several of his predecessors, people who came before him. He did not think the time ripe or ready for Russia to have a constitution, an elected national legislature or strong local government bodies. Russia's central authority remained what it had always been, an autocracy, which means government 
by a single person having unlimited power. So we still have those people, Kim Jong-un, uh, Fidel Castro's brother now, and I guess Mr. Ping in China, he just he was supposed to be voted out and someone brought in and he changed the law and he said, I'm in there forever. So I don't know. Uh, every variety of revolutionary doctrine was to be found in the Russian underground by the 1890s, ranging from Orthodox Marxism to peasant communes to nihilistic terrorism. As late as 1905, however, the government of the Tsar still seemed, seemed to be in undisputed control of the illiterate peasants and a small and doctrinally divided group of socialist workers in the towns. And the picture here, the Crimean War, the war in Crimea was the first to be photographed. Here, the English journalist Roger Fenton shows us an officer and men of the force dragoons in their encampment in 1855. At their side is one of the first military nurses. Wow. A colleague of Florence Nightingale. So like I said, I'm pretty sure this is over, right? Okay, we're done there. Okay, so let me go to the whiteboard. I have one last question. Grab that pencil. Uh, I usually give you 10. This is the last week. I'm giving you nine to match the week. One less question. Trying to be a little kind because I'm usually so tough. Oops, let me get my spelling correct. Oops, reforms, not reasons. I must be getting tired. Okay, oops. List some reforms of Russia's great reform. So there's a list. You don't have to give me all of them, just give me a couple. Give me more than one at least, okay? Let me stretch it. All right, there you go. Give you a few on that. Do, 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 do. I hope Temujin's doing well. I hope Inky's doing well. I hope uh, Pamela's doing well. Miss Bay, let's suck. Even Miss Gao. Okay. All right. So just list some of those reforms and we'll be done. Okay, let me grab the eraser. And again, list some reforms of Russia's great reforms. Again, not all, just a few, at least two. Okay, that's done. Okay, I stopped sharing. So uh, thank you for joining me this quarter, folks. I really enjoyed it. I always love teaching. I see a lot of the same folks here, which is fantastic. Again, you can always drop me a line on my Gmail and just say hi or how you doing and I respond to anybody who uh, talks to me so because I try to help all my students so everybody take care and uh, after this then the next week we will have the final exam okay I wish you the best thank you